Welcome back, friends, to the We Get Real AF podcast. I'm Sue Robinson. And I'm Vanessa Alava. Be sure to find at We Get Real AF across all social channels. And please take a quick moment to subscribe, rate, and comment on the show. Today, we are diving into how non-technical business founders can understand and navigate the technology aspects of your business. Our guest is Sophia Matveyeva, the founder of the Tech for Non-Techies education community. Sophia learned firsthand the challenges a non-technical founder faces when she started NT, a retail tech platform that connects consumers, stylists, and brands. Her company went on to win App of the Day by Mashable, and Grazia named NT one of the world's best fashion technology startups. But it also showed Sophia the need for better support for non-technical founders, so she founded Tech for Non-Techies. Sophia has contributed to the Financial Times, The Guardian, and Forbes on entrepreneurship and technology, and she has guest lectured at Chicago Booth and London Business School. She is also a fellow podcaster, and we're delighted to have her join us today on We Get Real AF. Welcome, Sophia. Welcome. Thank you so much, ladies. I'm so excited to be here. I'm a big fan of your work. And I just love how you are showcasing inspiring, interesting women in, in this industry and, um, and also sharing some really useful career tips. So thank you very much. Well, thank you yeah, for the kind words. You. We're excited to have you here. And before we dive in, we would love for you to share with our listeners how they can find you and Tech for Non-Techies online. Excellent. So uh, if, you, if the listeners are interested in discovering another podcast, there is the Tech for Non-Techies podcast, which is available on Apple or on Spotify. We also have a bunch of free learning on the Tech for Non-Techies Instagram or literally just techfornontechies.co. You can find us on Facebook or you can just tweet at me. I'm fairly active on Twitter at Sophia Matveva. Awesome. We uh, are really excited to speak with you because I think, I know for myself and, and Vanessa, you probably would agree with this, don't consider ourselves hardcore technologists. However, we are entrepreneurs and we are very much involved in the technology space. And, and I know that that is sort of your journey a bit as well, Sophia, that you were entrepreneurial first and, and then became a technology expert by necessity. So tell us a little bit about that journey, because I think that will feed into uh, explaining tech for non-techies and the need that you're filling. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I started working on an idea for a tech-enabled business when I was doing my MBA at Chicago Booth. And what MBAs are so good at is essentially they teach you a lot of business skills and they inspire you, but they're really bad in general at teaching you the basics of technology. That's, I think, because a lot of business schools, you know, even the top ones, I think they're still preparing you to work in consulting and in banking. And so when you learn about tech, you learn about the strategy of technology companies, but you don't learn basic concepts like what is a tech stack? What is an API? And um, so when I started working on this tech enabled business, and essentially I ended up raising some money and hiring a product team, which, you know, I basically did through lots of mistakes, and lots of errors. I ended up in a situation where essentially I was the boss. And, you know, when you're running a startup, as you know, you are already operating with so much uncertainty. But then when you're also working with developers, they literally speak a different language. They say words that I did not understand. And I would literally ask them what they meant and they would explain jargon with jargon, which really didn't help. And so obviously I wanted to look like I was in charge and I knew what I was doing. So I would kind of nod along cleverly and then I would secretly Google terms. But again, a lot of the YouTube videos, they are made by developers for developers. And so literally you just end up getting more and more confused. And I find that also in Silicon Valley parlance, non-technical founders are kind of seen as second-class citizens. And often there seems to be this idea that if you're non-technical, you're basically the support staff to the smart chief technology officer. And honestly, I do think that there is a gender lens to it because often there is a kind of, you know, the, the woman is the non-technical founder and she's doing, oh, the marketing. And then there's the adult supervision in the form of a CTO. And, you know, first of all, that's not really a world that I want to live in, but I do think that subconsciously a lot of us absorb that. 
And I certainly absorbed that. And if you even even if you look at Facebook, whatever you think about Facebook ethically, if we actually look at them, so there's Mark Zuckerberg, the genius developer, supported by Sheryl Sandberg. Yes, Sheryl Sandberg has you know made billions, but still she is the business support staff to the genius techie. And I think, well, definitely as a non-technical founder, when I came out of business school, even when I already was working with developers, you end up having a very large knowledge gap and you don't know how to fill that gap. And if you actually just listen to what mainly the tech bros out of Silicon Valley would they tell you, they would say, you need to learn to code because unless you know how to code, basically, what are you doing here? But realistically, as you ladies know, when you're running a business, tell me, when are you also going to fit in a coding course? Mm -hmm. And if you're going to be taking a coding course, what coding languages are you going to learn? Are you going to learn? How do you know how to choose when, when you don't know what you don't know? It's very, very difficult. And so essentially, I ended up having to learn on the job. And as I was learning on the job, I started writing for Forbes about my startup journey. And I thought, oh, well, I don't really know what I'm supposed to do as a non-technical founder, but by using Forbes, I can basically get a bunch of free consulting from all these smart non-technical founders who've succeeded. Because, if you know, me, just a random person, if I just write to famous, successful people, like they, they, they're not going to care. But if I write to them and say, I would like to interview you for Forbes about your success, basically everyone said yes. And so I wrote this article, the, the first one in the non-technical founder series was called What Non-Technical Founders Really Need to Know About Tech. And the thing is, I was doing it for me because I was a non-technical founder. I had already raised money and I had a team and I was like, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> you know, as the boss, you're not supposed to admit that like, you don't even know how to kind of set a goal because I knew how to set business goals, but I also had to set goals for the product team. And I had no idea how to do that. So I knew that, you know, we needed to raise money. I knew how to set a revenue goal, but you can't give a revenue goal to a developer. That's not what they do. So essentially, as I started interviewing more and more successful non-technical founders, and I basically, I became better at my job. I became better at translating business needs into technology strategy and kind of understanding how the two of them fit together. And as a result, my work got better, but also those articles became very successful. And I saw that there were lots of other people, essentially like me, people who have a professional background, people who generally, generally feel not very stupid. But when, we, when it comes to technology, we kind of feel like we've just discovered fire. And then there's, there's kind of a lot of shame, I think. There's a lot of shame, especially in the technology industry, which I do think women tend to overcompensate for um, and think, well, okay, I'm non-technical. I don't know enough stuff. So let me go and take all of these courses. And if I haven't taken all of the courses and learned all of the things, then I'm not good enough. And so if you add the non-technical in tech plus woman, I do think you end up with a bit of a recipe for, um, for overwork and learning a lot of things that, that essentially you don't know. And Tech for non Techies was really born out of my own experience of working with a product team and creating a tech-enabled business against, I think, a media parlance, which essentially tells you that you're basically not that great unless you have the adult, usually male, supervision of a technical co-founder. Well, Sophia, I just got to say, and I'm sure Sue is feeling the same way, but hearing you speak, we relate to you. And there are so many synergies because the We Get Really F podcast was born out of a desire for us to educate ourselves on mm -hmm. technology, science, what's out there that we don't already know. We, we had this foray into immersive tech because of the company which we worked with. It did a lot of amazing things in virtual reality and augmented reality. And we wanted to not only amplify the voices of women, but learn from these women have relatable conversations, really break down this jargon. When you said explain jargon with jargon, that happens all too often. And so many people can relate to the, uh-huh, mm -hmm. uh-huh, yeah, I get it. 
save that, go Google it when I leave this conversation. (laughs) And it's, and it's hard and we need to be more transparent about that. And I get the whole saving your own face in a way of like, okay, yeah, I I understand what you're saying. And I don't want to appear to be ignorant in a workplace because you don't want to lose that person's confidence in running into your point, your own business. So completely relatable. And, and just, I love what you're doing because again, we feel that. And that's, yeah. the, that's, not, that's why we were doing this podcast. Absolutely. And, you know, you, we talk a lot about the benefits of being vulnerable on this show, but there's a negative kind of vulnerability. I feel that women face in founders in, in the founder world in trying to get investment dollars and trying to hire a team mm-hmm. and getting taken seriously. And so we're kind of put into a corner where we do risk the chance of looking stupid. Yep. Um, you know, we're judged more harshly. And so I, you know, kudos to you for starting this, for acknowledging it, for bringing it out into the light of day. Um, and also I, I love what you did because it's sort of analogous to what Vanessa and I did in that you, you wrote for Forbes to get the intelligence and the knowledge from your guests so that you could, you know, apply that to your own business. That's really scrappy. <laughs> it is. <So. laughs> well, I keep on doing that with my podcast. So on the, on the Tech One and Techies podcast, I often speak to other non-technical founders and so I'm learning from them but also what's interesting is that I'm seeing a lot of the same problems because you know most most of these problems have been solved by somebody before so most of these problems are not really that difficult to solve and so it's good it's good to see patterns of different people solving the same problems successfully and also, I do think that the inspiration aspect is also really, really important. So mm-hmm. if you just, if you don't make an effort, it's very easy to literally just read TechCrunch. And I think for me, I don't know, TechCrunch is kind of as depressing as Instagram. <laughs> you know, when you look at Instagram and you're like, oh, everybody's living in this amazing life. And then there's, there's like me surrounded by like Kit Kat rappers. <laughs> <laughs> Like, you yeah, too? on my couch. <laughs> yes, I oh, would definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, and drawstring pants. So TechCrunch would also have you believe that like there are these founders who kind of like, they just graduated or, you know, they probably haven't graduated. They were studying computer science at Stanford. Then they rolled out, they rolled out of bed. They had an idea, they got millions and then like, whoosh, everything is great. And then you're like, well, if that's not me, you kind of feel like a loser. And it's very easy to fall into that belief. And so what I really want to show people on Tech on Techies, and also to be fair, still show myself, <laughs> that like tell a different story. Tell a story of people who don't have technical backgrounds and actually are quite proud of who they are. So are not just, you know, non-techies and tech who are kind of hiding and trying to compensate, but people who say, like, for example, Payal Chowler, who is the founder of ClassPass. So she created ClassPass because her background is in dancing. She was a dancer and she wanted to get to dance studios and she didn't know how to get to them. So she, she was having trouble booking dance studios. And because of that, she's created a, you know, a great business, which yes, is technology enabled, but it comes from the need of a dancer. You know, it mm-hmm. comes from the need of a busy woman also trying to find a workout. <laughs> and I think the more non-technical founders we have coming into the fray and the more people with different needs that we have kind of creating solutions I think basically the better off we'll be because otherwise we'll just have a bunch of tech dudes creating solutions for a bunch of tech dudes which is why there are so many laundry app deliver like laundry delivery services and like food deliveries because like they don't want to do their own washing up and they can't cook. <laughs> <laughs> but like I can do, I can do both. Like those are not my problems. I have other problems that they don't know how to solve. Well, that's a great for, uh, you know, for a, or, uh, Lee, uh, goodness, I don't even know what I'm t- trying to say right now. It's a good segue. That's a word, um, into, uh, right brain thinking versus left brain thinking and bringing both of these uh, groups of people together to your point to create better products, more innovative products, things that um, relate to more than just one group of people being the bros, the programmers, the uh, bro, rebe- brovelopers, et cetera. Exactly. Well, if we actually think about what is a product, a product is always a solution to 
somebody's problem. So for example, here I have a glass. And the reason why I have a glass is because I'm going to get thirsty and so I want to solve my problem of being thirsty. I'm not sitting there thinking, oh, I really want to use a glass. Like maybe some people do that, but I, you know, they're re really weird. <laughs> Most mm -hmm. people want to have a vessel so they could get a liquid into their mouth. So uh, this is how essentially, if you start thinking about product that way, then you can actually understand a lot of the, I think, diversity issues in how tech companies get funded and how tech companies uh, also get built. Um, because tech bros, you know, they're going to have different problems than I do. And so they, and they're not going to experience, you know, for example, let's look again at Kyle Chowler building class parts. She had a different problem because she was a busy woman who wanted to find a dance class. So she, she created the solution to that problem. But if you have a bunch of people who never experienced the problems that women experience because they're not women or never experienced the problems that people of diff different ethnicities experience because they're white and they've never been racially profiled, then how can we expect the people who never experienced those problems to create solutions for problems that they didn't even know exist. Exactly. And mm -hmm. if we leave just product, you know, basically technical product development, just to people who think the same, people from the same background, lots of solutions are not going to be created, which is not, you know, it's not just an ethical thing. It's also a money thing. Like there's, you know, like I'm a woman, I have disposable income, I'm willing to pay like I buy things, <laughs> so the yeah yeah no you buy things. So the more kind of variety and interesting and beautiful things that there are for me to buy and experience, like the more the economy will be stimulated too. Exactly, innovation doesn't come from an echo chamber, and I think that that's just the thing we always try to reinforce and remind people about here on the podcast. Because to your point, and I love the glass example. That's a really good relatable example that, that anybody can, you know, think about the solution to the problem after you've established what the problem is that you're trying to solve. Um, talk to us a bit about Tech for Non-Techies, the actual community, the platform, what kinds of things can people find when they go there? So it's really, it's really interesting. I am, um, I'm quite in awe of the people that we have in our current cohort. So there is there are two courses that I teach right now. One is aimed at non-technical founders. So it's literally called Introduction to Tech for Non-Technical Founders. And then there's a, another course which is aimed at leaders in companies. So companies that are going through digital transformation called How to Speak Tech. So How to Speak Tech for Leaders. So right now in our non-technical founders course, there is somebody who is doing her MBA full-time at Harvard Business School. There's another person who is currently doing an MBA at Oxford, Oxford University. And there are a couple of Chicago Booth grads, which really is making me think that what the hell are business schools doing? Because, you know, I do not believe that if you so, for example, I paid $180,000 for my MBA. I do not think it is fair that somebody who has paid like $200,000, you know, somebody who's paying like 200 grand to Harvard should also be paying me on top of that to take my course. So the reason why I'm giving you this example is that the people who are coming to Tech Techies, uh, the people who are learning there, the community, these are very ambitious people, but also these are very high quality people. Uh, so, you know, these are people who are highly educated. They're people who are already successful in their careers. And the reason why I want people to see that is that I think it's important to understand that not understanding technology and not knowing technology basics, it's not about not being experienced. It's not about not being smart. It's literally just not having learned the words. Mm -hmm. So our community in general, they're very high achieving people and they're very ambitious people who understand that the world of tech is a thing and they want to be an active participant in it, but they are also not going to retrain to become developers and data scientists. And so they, they take our courses and after they take our courses, a lot of them end up joining our membership where we have a live weekly meetup where we will have an expert um, talking about a specific aspect of technology. Like for example, last week we had somebody from Microsoft talking about Azure, which is their cloud computing platform, basically saying, 
how it works and like how they sell it to enterprises and why it's different from Amazon. And I make sure that if those tech experts go off too much of the jargon, which frankly they do, that I pull them back and I say, hang on, what was that word? What was that abbreviation? Because mm -hmm. in a normal tech meetup, there's so much jargon and you will see the non-techies basically sitting there feeling too shy and too embarrassed to admit that they don't know. But that's stupid. Nobody comes out of the womb knowing what an API is. Mm -hmm. It's very Good true. Point. It's like it's like going to another country and not speaking that language it doesn't make you stupid. It just means you haven't learned that language. Exactly. Right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You need to have that mindset about this. And to your point about paying as much money as we sometimes pay to send our children to college or to put ourselves through college, it's going to be interesting to see the shift in what happens in the future as it relates to education at, at the higher level. You know, do you go in and get your basics and then you get um, certification certificates that I think um, in this typical, you know, world that we've been living in, certificates aren't valued at the level that a degree is per se, but that you have your basic degree mm -hmm. and then these certificates have that equal value. And especially with technology that's changing so rapidly, that makes most sense. You know, so I, I love that you mentioned that. And I think that you're, you're giving people an extreme value that to Sue's point, aren't stupid, are smart, but maybe the technology courses that you're teaching and your uh, courses wasn't available when they were in school. So it's valuable to have these certificates and have the same weight uh, given to those certificates that a degree has after you have those basic skills. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the world is changing, but I also think that a lot of very well-meaning well governments have campaigns to get more people, you know, more women into STEM. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that those campaigns and that messaging can backfire because, you know, if somebody is going to be really good at math or they want to, do, to be a computer scientist, like, go for it. But if somebody is going to be a brilliant storyteller, a brilliant communicator, I would rather that they live in a world where they were encouraged to go and be a great storyteller. And so I actually think that these kind of get more people into STEM campaigns do make people who, who are right brain, they make people feel kind of stupid and, and left out. And I also think it's not a pragmatic approach. So from education reform, what I would like to see is that, yes, I want to see people getting into STEM. I want to see women getting into STEM, if that is what they want to do. But I also want there to be more education for non-technical professionals to understand enough about how technology works so mm -hmm. they can make choices about whether to participate in it and how to participate in it. Because, for example, in large companies, like literally I was having lunch today with somebody who's working with uh, Google's voice programs. And there are plenty of non-technical professionals working on those programs, especially psychologists who understand voice and how, how uh, you know, who understand into, um, in, intonation, that's the word, who understand intonation. Mm -hmm. And um, that's not something that, you know, people necessarily know about. And actually, I think telling those stories and showing that you can work successfully in technology, as long as you know how to speak tech, you know how to work with developers, you can be you know, focused on psychology or storytelling and still have a very fantastic career in tech. I think the more kind of, if we just widen tech education to also include essentially what I'm doing, I think that's gonna be a more inclusive and more pragmatic approach. I think that's very insightful that you say that, Sophia, because there is a huge focus on getting more women uh, into STEM and more girls into the STEM education system. And I think the reason for that is because, you know, research shows that girls, for, for one thing, STEM programming is not presented to young kids in a way that naturally appeals to girls. It tends to appeal more to boys just mm -hmm. innately. And then there's sort of this undercurrent of messaging that girls aren't good at science and math and things like that, so that they never go down that path and explore it. However, to your point, 
every company and every type of, of industry now has some technology component, right? And, and is a tech company or an industry on some level. And we need people in those industries who can explain it, who can make it interesting, who can make it relevant, who can make it creative. You can code the best software in the world, but if nobody's marketing it in a way that appeals to actual everyday humans, it's never gonna see the light of day, right? Um, and one thing that you had shared with us when we did our, our phone call before this interview was, and I wanna call it out here because I, I recommend it to people, was the documentary General Magic. Oh yes. Which um, I watched, I've watched it twice now, and it's such a great case study in how you can get, if you're that hard coding kind of mindset, you can get so excited about a product, but if you don't know how the business side of things works, you're doomed. So mm -hmm. I appreciate you sharing that. And it's, uh, it, it is the documentary story of the company General Magic, which is, was a spinoff of Apple. And it is uh, the most influential <laughs> tech company or Silicon Valley company that people haven't heard of because it gave rise to a lot of the technologies that we use every day now, like cell phones and thing, apps and things like that, but they didn't survive because mm -hmm. they didn't have a good suite of talent in their yeah. company. Exactly. Also, it was a one-sided company. So they created great technologies that couldn't be commercialized because actually now they were thinking so much about the technology and they weren't thinking about the users which is where i actually think a lot of non-technical professionals do have an advantage so if you are a non-technical founder or you're, you're a non-technical professional um, because because you're not going to be so enamored with the tech you can then get much more into the user's head and into the user's problem and so then you can understand okay well what we're building like the user like, think about it. When you are, you know, when you're going to a restaurant with friends and you're using like Open Table, you're not thinking, I really want to use booking software today. <laughs> like, nobody thinks that. Exactly. We're all thinking, okay, I need to get a bunch of people together and one of them is a vegetarian, the other one's vegan. Like, we all have different budgets and it needs to be in a place that we can all get to. So, essentially, like, that is the problem. And then there are lots of different ways that you can solve that problem. And one of them is going to be an app and one of them is going to, to involve AI. But one of them might just be like calling your super knowledgeable friend who actually knows restaurants. And that's not a tech solution. So this is where I think non-technical professionals can really excel because we're not thinking about the algorithms. We can really get inside the user's mind. And the more we understand about the user, essentially the better product and also the the better we can be at translating the, the product, so the, the tech product to an actual business strategy that makes money and can be commercialized. Absolutely. And it's the intersection of something that you love or a problem that, you, that you've discovered that you want a solution to, that you think more than one person want the solution to this problem, and then finding the tech team, right? It's, it's that intersection of both. And we say STEM a lot on our show because I think it's more of a general term, but we love STEAM and using the A in, in that STEM, STEAM uh, acronym, um, which is the arts in all of this. And I think that there is an art to, you know, knowing how to communicate to developers and the tech team, knowing how to bridge the gap, knowing how to say, hold on a second, what's that term? What does it mean? Because everyone over here is lost. And just being that effective leader in communication, in, in vision, and raising your, your hand in the room when no one else is talking and saying, hold on a second, have you considered this group using your product? You know, mm -hmm. they're gonna, they're not gonna, they're not gonna have that same connection that you're having because you're coming from this one place. So mm -hmm. it's all of those things that I really think that the A in STEAM encompass or encompasses. Yes, and it's a, it's a fairly new term. So I literally only started coming across STEAM fairly recently. Yeah. But if you actually think about it, it's a very Renaissance concept. So, uh, you know, Renaissance Europe, Leonardo da Vinci, that was art and science. And I think, you know, as, as we become more and more specialized in our professions, then people start kind of accepting that if I do one, then I'm not going to do the other. But surely... I mean, ultimately, don't we all also want to have a more rounded education? So, mm -hmm. so for, for example, a friend of mine who is a surgeon started, uh, told me that he listens to the Tech on Techies podcast. And I thought, 
first of all, I was really humbled because I think, oh my God, an actual surgeon. Like I, I, was, I was really like, <laughs> you know, I was like, oh my God, I, I, I better make it really good then. <laughs> you are really good. See, that's yeah. that imposter syndrome creeping in. <laughs> Absolutely. But then I asked him, I said, you know, first of all, he is working in a very technical job, but it's just, it's a different type of technical job. But I said, but you know, why do you care? What, what are you doing? Like, are you building an app on the side? And he said that he just wants to understand the world better, the, the world that we live in. And essentially, unless you are living in a cave, in which case you're probably not listening to this podcast, but unless you're living in a cave, you are a participant in the digital revolution. You are using mm-hmm. apps, your data is being used, you are, you're part of it. So I do think that also just having an understanding of how these things are built and what are the business motives behind how they're built can make you decide what you want to do with it. So for example, you know how at school, we all learn kind of the basics of electricity. Like I don't even really remember much, but like, you know, essentially kind of how it's generated and that there needs to be some kind of usually fossil fuel that is burned for us to have electricity. And Okay, if you just have this basic understanding, then you can decide, do you want to leave the light on in your bathroom when you're not using it? And that's just a really, really simple example that I think if we just have a very basic understanding of, okay, if I leave the light on in my bathroom when I'm not in it, then that is going to actually impact climate change because fossil fuel has to be burnt for this. Like for this, like I don't need a PhD in physics to explain all of this. Mm -hmm. We all know this kind of, just from some basic classes that we took at at high school. And I do think that that kind of very basic understanding of just how app sites and algorithms get built can also just make us conscious members of society. And then we can decide, well, are you, am I happy with the trade-off that I'm making? Like, I'm not saying that we, we will then all stop using everything and all disable cookies, but if you're enabling them, at least understand what it is Mm -hmm. and then like for for example I enable most of them because like I'm I prefer personal personalization which I also understand means giving up privacy but that's a conscious choice that I've made and I'd rather that we all kind of approached approach life a little bit more consciously um, rather than just being kind of sheep being used in Mark Zuckerberg's algorithms right you know I always um sort of draw this analogy in my head with technology to driving your car. Like you don't need to know how to build the car. (laughs) You just need to know how to operate it. So it can get you to where you need to go. So you can be productive in that place, Mm -hmm. you know? And I, I mean, we have lots of analogies that we've shared here today. Um, I'd like to just touch really quickly on empty and Mm -hmm. uh, what that, that app was and kind of what gave you that idea, because that was, was that your first company that you started? Yeah. So it was my, it was my first tech company. And um, so on the NT app, you can get professional feedback from professional stylists. So you can take a photo and you can ask a question like, should I wear this on a date? Or some of my favorites were when women were in shopping and sales and they were like, it's 80% off, but I'm not sure if the color suits me. And, you know, usually if it's 80% off, the answer is no, put it down, <laughs> it even though it's Dolce & Gabbana, like put it down and walk away. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so you could get, you would literally take a photo and you would get feedback within five minutes from, from a professional stylist if you had a premium subscription. If you didn't have a premium subscription, you would get votes from a community. And the mm. reason why we separate it in two ways is that, you know, we know, we women, we, we ask our friends and we send photos on messenger services all of the time. But, you know, our friends are not professional stylists and most people can't afford a professional stylist. But if you actually look at the professional stylist market, while they themselves are expensive and maybe they're charging, I don't know, $100 an hour, let's say, because they're freelancers, many of them would have, you know, a couple of clients in the afternoon, but actually they're kind of free most of the day so by allowing them to essentially make kind of micro income by advising women online it gave them an opportunity to earn and also it gives the opportunity to women who are maybe just shopping you know at like normal retail stores as opposed to indulging gabbana um gave them access to a premium service so 
uh, this, this was working really well when people were going out. <laughs> because essentially uh, what, what I realized is that our, our business was really dependent on events. Because if you think about it, when do we care about getting dressed up? basically when we're going to events that are going to get us more sex or more money <laughs> so when we you know if we're going on a date we are going to like think like i'm going on a date tomorrow i have been planning my outfit for the last two weeks <laughs> so uh, you know when, when when we go to parties when we do exciting things like this or when we're going to when we're going on job interviews for example or we're going to client client meetings and um for the past 18 months, basically, the use case for that has taken a nosedive, um, which meant, you know, our revenues like massively took a nosedive because nobody needs stylist feedback when you're sitting there on Zoom contemplating your mortality. <laughs> and so uh, I ended up in this really interesting situation during the pandemic where for the same macro reason, NT started essentially taking a nosedive but tech for non-techie started really growing because also during the pandemic what did we start doing we started taking online courses and we also mm -hmm. learned that technology is a booming industry and the industry that was basically actually benefiting from covid and so i ended up in a situation where i was like oh okay so literally the same event has been very damaging to one company and has been basically fuel for another one. And I'm so, I'm so lucky to have had both together because I think if tech fun and techies didn't exist, it would have just been a very mentally difficult journey. And I'm now in negotiations to actually sell the NTIP to people who have deeper pockets and can take the technology on because essentially the product is great, but what you need to do for a tech business you need to maintain the technology and there is a cost, which basically mm -hmm. means as a startup, you're either fundraising more money to do that, or you basically need to sell it on to people who have deep pockets and who can integrate it into what they're doing. And you know, if the market doesn't come back the way we want it to come back in the next six months, they've got the money to essentially keep it on hold. Whereas as a startup, you, you literally kind of have to always be growing. Um, so anyway, these, these are the processes that we're going through right now, going through due diligence, which is an interesting process. Not one I, not, not, yes. One that sometimes requires me to take a few glasses of wine, <laughs> <laughs> but definitely, definitely an interesting, interesting time in my life. Well, yeah. kudos to you again for being nimble and for continuing to iterate in your life and in your career uh, and coming up with, with new technologies and new solutions. Um, all those things are examples and lessons that are useful to any of us, any mm -hmm. of us entrepreneurial spirit. So, and is like the the insider on like what actually happens with with mm -hmm. startups. If if you're uh, contemplating a startup, if you're in the tech world, if you're not in the tech world, and you're like, hey, I really want to get into this. These are the things that happen sometimes. And being an entrepreneur, you have so many ideas going on, you know, at once. <laughs> Sue and I are very familiar with that. We're like, okay, hold on. Let's table that for a different day because we have to accomplish these goals today. Um, but to your point, you know, you had two companies that were, you know, that were your babies that were thriving at one point. And then obviously something came that no one expected. And tech really did benefit from this situation that we're all in. And thank goodness we had tech that enabled all of these other businesses to keep running. Um, but you're in a position now where you're going to be able to sell something that proved to be a value. And to your point, somebody with deeper pockets can put it on hold. When you're a founder or startup, like you don't have that luxury sometimes because you're constantly growing and wanting to do more and it takes money to do that. So um, yeah. Awesome. And congratulations to you. Because again, I think both businesses are, are awesome ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, what's interesting. So yesterday I was at uh, an event with some venture capitalists and I'm not fundraising for tech for non-techies, but I literally had inbound interest from venture capitalists because a lot of venture capitalists are actually not, they don't have technical backgrounds, but they invest in tech. Mm -hmm. And so I literally had, you know, these are like partners and funds. And so I literally had them being like, oh, wait, so where's your podcast? I need, I need this. And I was thinking, <laughs> oh my God, like you, you, 
I thought like you would know given <laughs> that you have made a lot of money investing in this industry and that there was a secret thing like don't tell anyone but I really need this because <laughs> it was interesting but I also really saw that like so this is my theory right now because one of the reasons why I've had such inbound interest from VCs in investing in techno and techies even though I'm not fundraising is because it is a problem that they understand and they experience mm -hmm. So they think, well, I, you know, they were closely saying that technology is changing so fast. There are always new words. And essentially, I need to always stay on top of this game. And my background is in consulting or in banking, usually. So I need, I, I need this stuff. And because they have this problem, they are then thinking, well, I can, like, I would pay to have this solution. So yes, I will fund this business. And then there were literally, I was being grilled about my business model. And I was like, I'm at a party. This is like, no. <laughs> <laughs> but when I was speaking to those same venture capitalists about uh, women getting stylist feedback, they were like, well, I just don't see the use case. I don't really like, I don't, I'm not going to invest in this. And I was thinking like, well, you know, now that I've had the experience of both, I'm really seeing that essentially if you have created a business that solves a problem for a rich white man you are going to find fundraising much easier i mean i did mm -hmm. raise money for the first company but it was it like it was an uphill struggle whereas i've literally had vcs reaching out to me on twitter saying like can we talk mm -hmm. and you know i always take the call and you know i might fundraise one day but it's just it's a very very different conversation when the person with the funds experiences the problem and you're fixing that problem versus them understanding like yes there are these creatures called women and they they do take photos and they do exhibit these behaviors and yes in theory they are willing to pay like it's kind of it's all so theoretical that yes you can you can raise money, but it's a, it's much more it's much more difficult to sell because you need to sell you need to sell them on the problem as well as on the solution. So this is it's just been you know for all the women who are listening, I do think that if you're if you are building a product aimed at women, it doesn't matter how great your revenue model is, doesn't matter how great your product is, if the investors you are speaking to don't experience that problem, the problem that you're solving is going to be that much harder for you to raise money. It just comes down to people invest in something if they get it. Right? Exactly. If they get it. And it's so basic. You don't have, I mean, that's they could complicate that in business school and try to explain investor theory and all these things. But at the end of the day, what you said is that people with money invest in the products and the services that they get, that they understand. I also think on the flip side, it can be a double whammy. And you know, if you're a female founder, and you have a female product trying to get male investors to get it versus even having a female product being pitched as a male to male investors, that's a different conversation because mm -hmm. I think that they're more like, oh yeah, that is a good idea. There's something there that's like this bro connection or whatever. Mm -hmm. And there've been examples even the last several months where there have been female products that have been invested in you know, the pitch by male invest, uh, male, uh, not even founders, just males, right? <laughs> they have this, this idea, they pitch it to get invested in uh, to a male uh, investor panel, they get the money. And then now they've been slammed on the internet saying, wait a second, this is a product for females. It's so off target. And they just got investment money. I mean, I've seen the articles on LinkedIn, and it's happened more than one time. And you're like, wait a second, what, where is the disconnect? Obviously having a robust team, a diverse team that's able to kind of say, yeah, that product will work, not won't work. But all of this to say, what you're saying is absolutely right. And I think that there's that added like nuance of if you have a male person pitching your product, could you potentially get investment money, even if you're the founder? It's a better shot. So I, to be honest, that's advice that I was given. I remember right at the beginning of my founder journey i was in new york and i was introduced to a very successful female tech founder in new york and uh you know i went into her fancy office and i was like wow she is going to just i just want to learn everything she has to say because she's awesome 
And one of the things she said, she said, was like, well, you know, just bring a man with you to meetings. Just bring him. And, you know, just get him to say things. And it doesn't matter. Like, you could just bring a friend. Like, it just just bring a dude and just get him to sit there and like maybe like give him a couple of sentences to say and it, your life will just be easier and and I said but do, do you really mean like a friend like a random like, like a just random a male person. presence <laughs> yeah, a like, token dude like, like exactly like if they're if they're sober and they're clean and they're male that's basically the barrier to entry <laughs> so and sad said, but so and true she said yes she said that she actually did like literally ask her friends to just come in and sit in on meetings and just be a reassuring presence and um you know what I actually I I did I did that uh I remember that there was there was a conversation that I needed to have which was a very difficult conversation I'd been telling that person before I was having a difficult conversation with about the issues and he just wasn't listening to me and so then I said I asked one of the angel investors in the company to literally I was like can you just say those same words I literally gave him the script I was like can you just be in a meeting with me so that the two of us will be in this meeting and you just say like I wrote down what he needed to say I was like just say these words and when those same words that I wrote were said by a person who yes he's an angel investor but like wasn't involved in running the business we actually had a conversation when we started reaching a solution and i'm like i'm the ceo how how mm, is this happening wow. but you know yes we can sit here and it can be we can be outraged or we can think like what this fabulous female founder from you told me it's like yeah i don't like it either but what do you want to do do you want to make a deal or not Right. <laughs> I actually think that you know we can sit there and we can be outraged, but that's not that's not going to get us where we want to go. So if that means that we need to do some hacks in the form of like just finding a random man and cleaning him up and like telling him what to say, then fine, I'm willing to do that. That just goes to show how strategic women have to be in mm-hmm. order to get to where they want to where they want to be eventually. And to, in order to succeed and not saying it always happens that way, but we hear these stories all too often. It's well, crazy to me. Yeah. But also I think when you, when you actually look at, for example, fund performance, or when you look at a, a first round capital, a venture capital firm actually based in New York, they said that female founded teams in their portfolio tend to outperform. Um, I do think, think that just the school of being a woman and kind of learning all of these hacks and all of these tricks and also learning self-control like you know when you really just want to tell somebody what you really think of them but instead you're like no I will breathe and I will kind of say some kind of small strategic thing and then I'll and then and I'll figure it out another way I think that kind of school of life it does just make you better and more resilient um, mm-hmm. And so that means that, yes, you, you're probably, you've had a tougher schooling, so you're more likely to be more successful. And if, if we actually look at fund performance, so female fund managers tend to outperform male fund managers. And I don't think it's, you know, because women are smarter genetically, like, I don't think that's a thing. I don't think that's true. I think it's just women often have to learn tougher survival mechanisms just because it's more difficult. That's a great insight as well. You know, being resourceful, being Mm -hmm. forced to be really resourceful pays dividends, you know, whereas to your point, Sophia, like blowing up at the the ridiculousness of some of the discrimination that you face along the way might make you feel better in the moment. And you might feel like you're a warrior for, for, you know, equality and all those things. But at the end of the day, do you want to make a deal or not? And if you can make the deal, and if you can be resourceful, then we'll have more women in positions of influence and with the financial wherewithal to help lift others. And hopefully that's what will come of all this. So um, great insights. I'm ready for us to move on to the lightning round, if you ladies are. Uh, actually, before the lightning round, I just had like a quick, and I might be putting you on the spot, Sophia, but since this is mm-hmm. what you do, maybe top five or top three 
like acronyms or terms that are widely used that we hear all the time that you find most people have no idea what they mean? Like, I would love to mm-hmm. kind of. Okay. API is You're one, some- right? <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's start with front end and back end because most people don't understand what, what that is. Basically, in a software product, so like an app or, or a website, if you can see it and you can touch it and you can speak to it, that is a front end. So a front end is a computer that humans interact with. Like literally, that's what you need to remember. And then the second term is a back end. So a back end is the bit of the computer that you as a human, you will never see. So essentially, most tech products, and uh, this is a third term, will have a tech stack. Literally, just think of it as a, like a stack of pancakes. So you have the top, and the top is going to be the front end. Like if you can see it, if you can touch it, if you can lick it, if you can speak to it, it is a front end. And the bottom of the stack is going to be the back end. And so, for example, when your fr- when your when your phone is on airplane mode, the connection between the front and the back is cut off, basically. Mm. And uh, so I think that is that is a really really key term. And in, in general, the back end is more complicated and it takes longer to build. So for people who are non technical founders, your first your biggest investments at the beginning are going to be the back end because the back end in general is where all the memory and all of the algorithms that's that's kind of that's the invisible expensive foundation of your house. So those are those are three terms. And the back end is basically a computer that only speaks to computers. A front end is a computer that speaks to humans. Mm. Should I give you more terms or am I like, I don't know if it's, if it's if I'm breaking people's brains. That was really great. That was a great, no, that was great. <laughs> description. Very, very straightforward. I love that. Awesome. Well, yeah. I think I actually do honestly believe that when you dig down below the jargon, most of the stuff is actually quite easy to understand because it's logic. So it's, it's quite when, when you actually, when you have somebody who just explains it to you in human language, it's not complicated. I think the complication is that you often have people who've been doing it for so long, explaining it to people who've heard it for the first time. Yep. So it's not that the concepts are hard to understand, it's that the explanations are so bad. Mm-hmm. I agree yeah. completely. Awesome. Well, I think that that lightning round is in order. Are you ready for the lightning round, Sophia? Absolutely. Yay. Awesome. Uh, Sue, do you want me to start? Sure, go for it. Awesome. All right. So lightning round, fun uh, round of questions that we kind of just give our guests to get to know them on a personal level. Um, First one is, what are three pieces of advice you'd give your younger self? Okay. Number one, do not put up with sleazy men at work. <laughs> so I, I took I took so much really terrible behavior from like sleazy colleagues or sleazy clients because I didn't I didn't know what to do. So I kind of politely batted it away. So no, do not do that. Another one is always ask for more because yes. sometimes you'll mm. get it. Sometimes you'll get it. <laughs> and uh, the, the third one is network. Actual, like networking is work. Sitting at a lovely lunch with somebody interesting for three hours is work. It is sometimes, it is often more important than sitting at your computer and writing emails. So go to lovely lunches with interesting people. Excellent, excellent pieces of advice. Sophia, how do you define success? Oh, I'm always thinking about that because I know that you're supposed to say, oh, in a piece. (laughs) Well, (laughs) you know, I maybe, but I'm not, that's not the stage of of life that I'm in. So for me, success is actually building something that I didn't think was possible for me. So I think success is, it is still an internal thing, but it's doing something, succeeding at doing something that you thought was impossible. Like when, when I do, when I achieve that, then I feel pretty damn good about myself. Mm-hmm. What celebrity would you cast to play you in a movie? Oh my God. Um, well, can I say the young Sophia Loren? Of course. Of course you can. I think that's an <laughs> yeah. excellent choice. <laughs> Who would want the we young Sophia Loren? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. 
Um, what is something about you that people would be surprised to learn? That people would be surprised to learn? Well, maybe that um, one of my favorite things to do when I was an 11 year old girl was to watch British snooker on TV for hours. Because I'm actually, I'm Russian, I'm from Moscow. So when I moved to London, I didn't really speak English. And so when you think about it, watching cartoons was very, very difficult. But the World Snooker Championships were on and there wasn't much talking, but like the stuff happens. So I was literally glued to the TV watching um, snooker championships. So like, I'm a closet snooker fan. <laughs> Very cool. So you've never had that. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Sophia, last one. Fill in the blank. Blank like a girl. Orgasm. Okay. (laughs) That works. Again. That was a new one for us too. (laughs) I I mean, yeah. Love it. Why not? (laughs) <laughs> why not <laughs> well female liberation like uh, you know I, I, if we're going to go for equality we might as well go uh fr- from the bedroom to the boardroom and back again mm-hmm. i love yes that. absolutely empowered in both places 100 <laughs> exactly <laughs> upstairs well, and that's downstairs the that's right. <laughs> well that's that's the mind body connection and uh yes. i mean i i used to work with a with a coach that literally like her teaching was that if you have a good sex life you're basically going to be confident in all of in all of other areas of your life and so she was like you need to invest time and thinking and education into your sex life because once you get confident there then actually like once you've conquered your demons in that arena then going and negotiating an investment deal is going to be much easier and in my experience that that works (laughs) We need to introduce you to Bryony Cole, one of yes, our other awesome guests who uh, is the head of sex tech school, and she's empowering wow. women in the sex tech industry and all different uh, inventions and innovations in that space. And she, she would agree very much with that. I think that's great advice. So. Thanks. I think Excellent. it is. I'd love, Thank to, you. I'd love to meet her. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> well, Sophia, you've been awesome. I, we, again, there's so many synergies with what you're doing mm-hmm. with what we believe in. So thank you for what you're contributing and, um, tech for non techies, uh, go check it out and go check out the podcast and thank you just for your spirit and vivacious energy. This has been fantastic. It has. Thank you. Thank so much. you ladies. It's been such a pleasure.